Greetings and welcome to another study in the uh, Spirit of Prophecy series. Um, and um, and today we're going to continue um, on looking at the 70 weeks of Daniel. Um, we're going to kind of digress a little bit. So this is going to kind of be like a study within a study because we're going to be talking about the second half of verse 26 and the second half of verse 27. Um, we're not going to talk about the first half of the um, 27th verse because uh, that's going to be saved for a future video. Um, but I wanted to uh, touch base on these things here. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay. We're going to be touching base on a lot of things here. And the first thing I wanted to touch base on is... There are those that... Uh, <clears throat> We have to really be very careful in talking about dual fulfillments versus typology. And we're going to get into things that seems like it's dual fulfillments, but it's not. It's typology. And typology is very, very, very much scriptural. Okay. <clears throat> Basically, typology is is you have a type and you have an archetype. The type gives you a small portion. The archetype gives you the grand scale. Okay. And just like as in Isaiah, or not Isaiah, but as a, as in uh, Ecclesiastes um, states that uh, the things that have been is that which shall be. The things that has been done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Okay? Doesn't necessarily mean it's due fulfillments of events. But what it does mean is there is spiritual applications and there is archetype applications, which manifests itself into the physical. Okay? And what we're going to be getting into in these second half verses of 26 and 27 is correlated with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now a while back I did a uh, historical reading of the accounts of 70 AD and um, for those that don't know about that I'll provide the link to that video in the, in the description box below. There were some very remarkable things that were going on in those last four years from 66 to 70 AD. There are some things that I did not cover, and some of those things that I did not cover, I'm going to cover here. For example, the aspect of pray not that your flight be in the winter or on the Sabbath day, and these types of things. There was a very unique incident that happened when the armies of Rome, the Roman legions, were surrounding the city. There was one legion, for one reason or another, decided to, decided to back out and at that moment those that heeded the words of Christ fled the city and fled into the mountains okay um, and it was not on the Sabbath day because during the Sabbath the gates are closed from sunset to sunset Friday to Saturday and these types of things so no one goes in no one goes out okay um, and also when that specific legion or platoon or whatever you want to call it um, was there, no one was going out, no one was coming in. They were surrounded. But something happened to the point where that legion backed out, which gave an opening for those that heeded the warnings of Christ to flee. 
Okay, and then after all of those that followed Christ were out, then that's when everything really went haywire. Um, and if you have not watched my video regarding divine pronouns, you really need to watch that. Okay, you really need to watch that before you even continue with this video. I've seen some comments on here. Um, whereas verse 27, when it talks about the lowercase h as e, um, that some applied that to, you know, the Antichrist and these types of things. And they weren't even futurists at all. Um, and it, it is not talking about um, the prince that shall come. Okay. So that was really, you know, that was really unique. Um, but again, divine pronouns is not necessary. Okay, there is, I I can't even do a video long enough that that connects lowercase he's and hims and ours when it connects to God the Father and us and and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's all over the place. Okay, and it's in your King James Bibles. Okay, so when we get into, because we're going to get into Matthew 24 a little bit, you need to understand that these things are not necessarily dual fulfillments, but they are types. Just like Paul stated, that these things are shown to us as examples. Okay. Um, these are types, and the archetype is virtually a mirror image, although on a different scale. Okay, you understand what I'm getting at? For example, the physical city of Jerusalem was destroyed. Those, again, the people or the physical city of Jerusalem was destroyed um, <clears throat> let level to the ground not one stone was left upon another and these type of things this was fulfilled in 70 AD and what happened was you had those that heeded the warnings of Christ which you can find in Matthew 24 Mark 13, Luke 21. They heeded these warnings because these warnings started to be readily apparent. And so those that were in Christ fled Jerusalem into a safe haven. Uh, I believe the name is Pella. And that's where they sojourned. Okay. <clears throat> And from there, they witnessed the desolations that came upon the city and the destruction. Flash forward to our day. This is an example of an archetype or antitype. The, the um, eschatology in the Bible is has basically shifted from a single geographical location to a spiritual and global um, application. What do, I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, when you read the accounts of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, you see a whole bunch of warnings that Jesus Christ gave to the disciples after the d disciples asked them a question <clears throat> now when we look at this in type and anti-type you can picture Jerusalem as representing the whole world okay and those that need to come out of that city will be heeding the warnings of Christ and they will be spared 
okay? Because they would have heeded the warnings of Christ, and therefore <clears throat> they were not a part of the destruction that came upon, or they will not be a part of the destruction that comes upon the world. Speaking of the last plagues, okay? So... <clears throat> that's basically a brief example of um, type and antitype or type and archetype some people use antitype some people use archetype I'll probably use both those words interchangeably so don't get confused <laughs> um, but I just want to lay that little bit of a foundation there because uh, <clears throat> both the, the destruction of Jerusalem is, is referenced in Daniel 9 as well as the 70 weeks. And obviously the 70 weeks came before the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. Because all of this happened after three score and two weeks. After the 69th week. Messiah was cut off. Confirmed a covenant with many for one week. Miss of the week. He was cut off. Cause, causing the sacrifices and oblations to cease meaning that the sacrificial system was null and void it had no merit it had no there was no more reason for sacrifice because Jesus was that perfect sacrifice okay so when we look at desolations are determined desolations comes from the the Hebrew sham, shamem which is to stun or destroy or wonder Okay, stun, destroy, make amazed, be astonished, astonishment, be, bring, unto, unto, lay, lie, make, make desolate, make desolation, make desolate places, be destitute, destroy self, or just destruction, make waste and wonder. Okay, and then determined, it's pretty simple, to decide properly to point sharply that is literally to wound figuratively figuratively to be alert to decide to decree to determine okay and that's from the Hebrew word kataratz which is H2782 those two words are found in Daniel 926 and when we look at Daniel 927 we see the words overspreading which is a flap of the earth basically a section of the earth so when you look at this, you gotta. It's very important that um, when studying scripture, especially prophecies, okay, we have to understand the mindset of the people at that time. Okay, we have to understand. We have to put ourselves in that. Time, you know, in that time frame. Like, for example, in Matthew 24, when the disciples ask, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Okay. <clears throat> so clearly there was a present tense, and there is a future tense within the Olivet Discourse, and there's also significances that can apply that can be applied to both time frames. You know, the, the present tense as it was during the Olivet Course discourse and future. It doesn't necessarily mean that it these things are dual fulfillments. But when you see verses like and there will be earthquakes in diverse places and famines and pestilences and these types of things Though and wars and rumors of wars, nations against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms, and these types of things, those things can be applied in a typological form. It had its literal fulfillment in 70 AD, and it has a global fulfillment during our time. Do we not see the increase of earthquakes and and natural disasters and? these types of things, animal die-offs, famines, pestilences, you know, uh, 
rather the pestilences are man-made in the laboratory or not. And, you know, the Bible just says pestilences. Okay? Diseases. Famines. We know that was clearly going on, especially in the last four years of Jerusalem's history, prior to 70 A.D. So, obviously, that can be applied to that time as well. To as well as our time today. Okay, it's just a matter of looking at 70 AD as an example as to what we can expect to see in the latter times. Okay. <clears throat> so basically this overspreading of abomination and if you look at the context of this of this uh, prophecy this is specific, specifically, specifically to the Judeans, to Judah, Daniel's physical seed, physical people, okay? This is what this whole prophecy is about, okay? The Messiah was not promised to any Gentile nations. The Messiah was not promised to aliens. <laughs> the Messiah was not promised to any other tribe or nation but Judah or Israel. Okay. And so this prophecy is strictly for the city of Jerusalem and the Jews. That's it. It can be applied to no other people. <clears throat> Because Daniel's people is obviously the Jews. It's plain and simple in Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. <clears throat> and so consummation, the word consummation, which is found in Daniel 9.27 that we just looked at, means a completion <clears throat> adverbially completely also destruction altogether be utterly consumed consummation um, or consumption was determined full utter end or riddance now this word consummation is it, it's me its meaning is completion or complete you know total destruction now, if God intended to have a complete, utter destruction regarding Jerusalem, did God change his mind in 1948? I don't think so. And so, when you look at the physical city of Jerusalem now, even though it's in the same geographical location, it's not even the original Jerusalem. It's been built on top of the rubble and the laid stones of the old Jerusalem. Okay, sure, there is still some sites you can go, but and check out, you know, and for touring attractions and these types of things. But you're not going to get a special blessing for visiting Israel. You might get a physical experience of awe and wonder just for the aspect of the historical context of the place, but that's it. Okay. <clears throat> so, so, in, and, and obviously, when you look at Matthew 23 38. Jesus stated plainly, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And we see the words desolations, desolate, consumption, overspreading of abominations, and these types of things. Okay, so when Jesus said, Your house is left unto you desolate, what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? Well, and four chapters later in Matthew 27, 50-53, we read, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. 
And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Okay, so, basically, the veil, or a cur or curtain, divided the holy place from the most holy place. Okay? You couldn't just enter into the most holy place, or you'd die. Okay? Um, that's why the high priest entered only in once a year, and these types of things. <clears throat> um, but once that temple was rent in two, that signified that God's presence was no longer going to dwell in temples made with hands. Now, has God decided to change his mind and say he is going to dwell in the temple made by the Jews as if they build a third temple? No, there is no change. Okay. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when contending with the Pharisees, stated, destroy this temple and in three days I will make it rise again. The Jews answered, you know, it took 46 years for the building of this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? And Jesus stayed, stated that he spoke of the temple of his body. That's what he said. So Jesus is the temple. Those that are of him are the pillars of that temple. Hence we we in Christ are the temple of God. Okay? Not a temple made with hands. And this started right here when Jesus gave up the ghost. And so therefore, there was no need for sacrifices. Because obviously the sacrifices were done at the temple and these types of things. And, and Peter talks about that we need to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. As in what? Devotion to his word. Right living. Righteousness. And these type Obedience. Um, not being conformed to the things of this world. Um, I mean, there's just many examples of this. So, and in Mark 15, 37 through 39, we read, And Jesus cried with a loud voice cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. <clears throat> and finally, in uh, Luke's account, we read in 23, 44 through 46, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. <clears throat> so it's readily apparent that Jesus, the Spirit of God, God the Father, has left the house. It's desolate. And from, that, from this point on, Sacrifices and oblations ceased in remembrance to God. <clears throat> they ceased to be um, they ceased in meaning. They ceased as in they were no longer going to be accepted by God because God gave up his son to be the ultimate sacrifice confirming a new covenant And in this new covenant, there is no need for the shedding of blood from bulls and goats. And so therefore, God will not honor these sacrifices anymore. Hence, the sacrifices and oblations ceased. And they continued, and they continued. And ultimately, what it was, was an abomination in the sight of God. Now you have Christians out there today 
that are supporting the Jews and supporting Israel in the building of a third temple so they can start up their sacrifices again and these type of things and so what what are they doing by doing that to those people over there they are causing those people to eat and drink damnation unto themselves because there is no remission of sin by the shedding of blood of bulls and goats there is going to be no acknowledgement from God via animal sacrifices at all, period. Will not happen. And so, rather knowingly or unknowingly, these Christians are, they are essentially lying to the Jews because they believe in a version of prophecy that has no barons, baron on scripture now sure I mean you take verses here and verses there you splice them together a little bit you can come up with some very very unique interpretations but with all of these different schools of prophecy and there's a, there's four of them okay there's only one that really deals with the aspect of context and yes there is no problem in studying out one single verse but the thing is when you study out just one little tiny verse you have to go through the, from the beginning until the end to see how that verse fits with other portions of scripture that's why a lot of times I don't go and you know when I do a study I don't use just like one verse and then just do a whole study on that because that can lead into private interpretation <clears throat> if I do a study I'm just a portion of the you know a, a portion of scripture like one verse I will always at least go two to three verses up and two to three verses down or I'll read the chapter beforehand making the presentation and then you'll see the context of these things. The historical school really is the only one that does that. Um, you know, to each their own, you know. I mean, it's you know, you 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 have your choices of how to how to believe. I mean, your problem is not with me, it's not with anybody else. Your problem is with God. In scriptures so take these things up to God in prayer study these things out for yourselves without the bombardment of teachers and YouTube videos being bombarded into your head and just accepting these things as gospel truth look these things up yourselves do your own work just because people are, are, are doing these things out here doesn't give you a free pass to just sit there and watch it and say oh okay that sounds good you can't do that. So, let's go ahead and move on. <clears throat> In John 8, and this next section is basically going to be titled, Israel equals faith and not bloodline. Why is this important? Because as we go deeper in to all these studies that I have planned out you're gonna see why Israel is about faith it's not about bloodline okay and it always has been that way <clears throat> and um, and so when you look at like for example in Acts chapter 7 all the way up until Acts chapter 13 where Paul stated it was it was right that the word should be first pre be preached unto you the Jews but since you have rejected it lo we turned we turned to the Gentiles a couple chapters previous Stephen was stoned and these types of things and then you have verses which say that they are not all Israel which are of Israel and then you have verses that say all Israel will be saved. Well, the question is, is which one? Because when you look at 
both those verses, I think they're both in Romans. Um, they are not all Israel, Israel, which are of Israel, and all Israel will be saved. And then you look at the context of the Israel of God, and we understand that this is a spiritual connotation. Then understand that those that are in Christ, those that have acknowledged who Christ is and believe on his name and believe in him and believe on his atoning sacrifice, are the true Israel of God. The children of the flesh are not the children of God, meaning the children of bloodline descent regardless of what race you are, are not the children of God. <clears throat> now, let's go ahead and look at John eight fifty one through 59. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? And Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. And by the way, that he is talking about the father. And it's a lowercase h. Okay, same thing with with the, the next verse. Yet ye have not known him, the Father, but I know him. And if I should say I know him, not I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. even though he never physically saw the Messiah. I mean, physically never saw Jesus, but he rejoiced to see his day. He knew that there would be a coming promised one. Okay, and this was before there was a Jew. So Abraham believed he had faith, and yet he did not see, but he saw spiritually speaking he understood he, he he understood these things he knew that there was going to be a promised messiah and abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad then said the jews unto him thou art not yet fifty years old and hast thou seen abraham and jesus said unto them verily verily i say unto you before abraham was i am then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So again, Israel equals faith and not bloodline. Here we see another Abraham-type example, and this is an example for us. In the case of Thomas, in John 20, from verse 26 to 29, it states, and after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. This is after Jesus was crucified and after his resurrection. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. No. Pay attention to what Jesus stated here. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me in the flesh, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, obviously, that is applicable to post-ascension of Christ. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, prior to the prior to the coming of the Messiah, you had men of faith like Abraham, who did not see, but they were blessed because they understood it, and they believed and they rejoiced in it. <clears throat> 
Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way. You can't dance around this. <laughs> There's no way you can dance around this. Alright. Um, if you do not have the Son, you do not have the Father. Okay. So, how can a physical... bloodline descent of people who deny the Son be the chosen of God. It's impossible. It can't be done. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now Galatians 3, 26 through 28 states, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So I wanted to drive this point home because... Oh, one more text. John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And what's and there's some very unique things regarding the word Israel and how it's connected to the vine. And as a matter of fact, in the psalm, it says Israel was a vine out of e out of Egypt. You look at uh, the New Testament, and um, you have Jesus who states that I am the vine. So, without going too deep into this type of a study, from those two verses, you can basically put the aspect of Israel and Jesus as one and the same. So, Israel, in a sense, is Jesus. And Jesus is Israel. And those that are in him are the branches of that vine. Or you can substitute that word for children. His people. Rather Jew or Greek. If Jew, they can be grafted in again. All they have to do is abide in the vine, the true vine, which is Jesus Christ. It's just that simple. Without that... then there is no chosen. Without the Son, there is no chosen people. You can only have a chosen people if you have the Son. That's it. A desolate house. <clears throat> we're going to go over um, a couple of par uh, we're, we're going to go over a parable here in Matthew 21 which kind of lays the groundwork for the uh, study of the 70 weeks or uh, not the, the destruction of Jerusalem and the um, preparations leading up to that time <clears throat> Matthew 21 33 through uh, 46 here another parable there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, plural, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. But last of all he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. 
But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. So what, who, who does the inheritance of the kingdom of the vineyard belong to? It belongs to the son. That's who it belongs to. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It doesn't belong to the husbandman. It belongs to the son. <clears throat> and they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Okay, so this is what he's asking the Pharisees. And in a sense, they kind of answered right. They did answer him right. In a sense. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Now if we just stop right here, before Jesus continued... At this point, in this verse right here, I honestly don't think that they thought that the, that Jesus was speaking of them. Okay. And I think, and obviously, Jesus knew this. Because Jesus responded in verse 42, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So it was the Lord that planted the vineyard and hedged it round about and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen. It was the Lord who sent forth servants to reap the harvest. And the husbandmen killed them, beat some, stoned others. And again, he sent other servants and they did the same thing. But then the Lord sent his son, his only son, who had the inheritance of the vineyard. And what did they say? This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbands. And this is what the Pharisees responded to the question that Jesus asked. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? But then Jesus responded... In verse 42, and after what Jesus stated here, that's when the Pharisees and the chief priests got the hint that this parable was about them. This parable was about Judea. This parable was about the Jews. Judah. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, given to a people, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So, you want to be broken, you want to fall upon this stone. You don't want the stone to fall upon you. You want to be broken before God. You want to be convicted of sin. You want this stone you want to fall upon this stone but those that do not fall upon the stone it will fall on them and it will grind them to powder and when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parable they perceived that he spake of them but when they sought to lay hands on him they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet And in Matthew 23, 29, this isn't a parable, but this is basically, a, you know, the stern rebuke leading up to Matthew 24. Um, I'm not going to read the whole of Matthew 23, just to 
very key portion of it that I want to focus in on. Starting in verse 29 and ending with verse 39. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up then the measures, measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from, from city to city. Has this not happened? Especially after Christ's ascension? happened quite a bit <clears throat> that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias son of Barachias whom you slew between the temple and the altar verily I say unto you all these things shall come upon this generation what generation the present tense generation that Jesus is speaking to here O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then when you look at the account of Stephen, I'm just going to use two verses here, it states, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So, um, and again, when we go into the study of the final week, after we break down 70 AD, you're going to see the vast similarities between Stephen and Christ. Stephen was basically the last bastion of hope for the Jewish people. To get them to hopefully open their eyes. And they were cut to the heart. You know they they were they were cut to the heart and they were upset they were so upset that they didn't want any part of this Jesus and then they didn't want any part of Stephen and so they tossed their coats and they stoned him and there was a man by the name of Saul who was a persecutor of the church that laid witness and all the coats and stuff were thrown at his feet or he held them while they stoned Stephen and on the road to uh, and on the road to Damascus he fell upon the stone and was broken before Jesus Christ and he was converted and shortly after when speaking to the Jews him and, Bar him and uh, Barnabas laid out one final warning this was it this was your last straw that it was meant that the word of God should be first preached unto you but since you Reject it, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And so now, rather Jew nor Greek has no meaning. For all, whosoever believeth on him, all Israel will be saved.
the Israel of God, those that are in Christ. So I wanted to really go over this section here to again stress the importance of this because there are people out there that just will totally deny this um, this study you know because they are so wrapped up with this whole Israel situation and Jerusalem and you know all the prophecies being fixed on a physical geographical location in which really the prophecies <coughs> specifically in Revelation what they do is yes they use geographical locations but they use geographical locations to explain things on a global scale okay so let's go ahead and continue now we're going to go into Matthew 24 1 through 21 <clears throat> And uh, and after we get done with uh, the whole Daniel 9 study here, um, I am going to go over each account of the Olivet Discourse. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I don't believe John has the account of the Olivet Discourse. Um, as a matter of fact, I know it doesn't. So those three gospel accounts is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew basically is is the more simple version of it. Uh, you know, I mean, if you really earnestly study it, which God, you know, loves an earnest earnest studier of His Word. Um, if you earnestly study the Olivet Discourse and other accounts, it can seem a little confusing because there's a lot of jumping back and forth. That seems like well, it seems like Jesus is talking about this here. And but it sure sounds like this is about the end of the you know the final you know the last the the last generation you know our generation um, and he 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 bounces back and forth he he, he goes all over the place and, and and I think he does this so that people can understand the aspects of well examples. Okay. So after this whole portion of the series is done, we're gonna I'm gonna go over each account, and I'm gonna color code the you know all the chapters that talk about this. Meaning what what is what was fulfilled basically in 70 A.D. and leading up to it, and what um, can be applied to the future as well to 70 A.D. And then what are what can be applied to the future beyond seventy AD? You know, so because all of those things are covered. So let's go ahead and get started here. Matthew twenty four one it states, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? It's very important, these two words here. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. Okay, so it seems like there's three things going on here. You have when shall these things be, meaning uh, when shall these things be that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. What shall be the sign of thy coming? Jesus just didn't give him give them a sign; he gave them plenty of signs to look for. So you have the season of his coming, and you have the end of the world. And so Jesus answers all three interchangeably, you know, here, there, here, little, there, little, within the context of the ch of the chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but they're all there. So you can't really, you know, you just gotta really look and see 
which portions apply to what. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now obviously we know that is applying the whole the whole of the church from its infancy all the way until the second coming of Christ. That deception is going to be the main focal point. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And that doesn't necessarily have to be that people coming, saying, I'm Jesus. This could just be, be simply meaning a, a person of authority, you know, that, you know, teaches in front of large groups, you know, and these types of things. People that claim they are anointed of God to preach the gospel and these types of things. That's also what this is in reference to. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There was a very, very clear example throughout the early church, especially with uh, Simon Magus and his followers, okay, who wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to go into that now, but um, that's just one example you can look at within the Bible itself. And then obviously, flash forward to our day, all the way through the Middle Ages, all the way up into our day, you have a whole slew of deception out there from these so-called um, ministers of Christ. But there are ravenous wolves who have no love for the sheep. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. This can be applied to both 70 AD and our day as well. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. <clears throat> and you can actually use this as, since this is in italics, you can just read this, for all must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And you can also use these things. So in a sense, this verse here is also applicable to both, to both present tense and future tense. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, people against people. You know, you, you had different groups of Jews that were trying to reason with, you know, the Roman authorities, and you had those Jews going after those Jews that were trying to reason, and they were initially called by the Romans zealots. In our modern terms, they would be rebellious, rebels against the state. Okay, and um, you had Jews that were going to compromise, you know, just like today, like the whole um, truth movement and these types of things that really is spawned on a state of rebellion, a lot of it, patriotism, okay, um, and those that don't go along with that are ultimately going to be shunned. And they are going to be just as much the enemy as those in the so-called truther movement have labeled as the enemy. You know, so, so again, you have the same context. People against people. You have racial divisions, you know, and these types of things. And kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Whew, man. Beginning of sorrows has been a long, long time now, hasn't it? Especially if you take into account 70 AD. And looking from that point on. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Persecution. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, obviously shall rise, pertaining to future tense, as well as leading up to 70 AD, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Obviously, again... This can be applied to both 70 A.D. and current times. 
And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, all peoples, and then shall the end come. Now that right there is our day. Right here. And many will be offended by it, and many will betray one another. Just like it was leading up to the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. You see how things can be used as examples. You see how um, how in Ecclesiastes now you now can you somewhat understand that what seems like dual fulfillments are not fulfillments, but they are types and shadows, just like the sacrificial system and the law of Moses and these types of things were types and shadows pointing to Christ. When you look at the words of Christ here in Matthew 24 and the other two accounts, you have what's given out a clear picture of what is going to happen to Jerusalem culminating in 70 AD. And all of these things we can look at as examples in our current time. Okay, There are certain things that basically only apply to this generation meaning you know the generation in the present tense of what Jesus is speaking of here <clears throat> and this is one of those cases in verse 15 when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoso readeth let him understand what was the holy place the holy place was the temple then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as, such as was, not, was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Okay, so what can we look at in these verses here that can be pertaining to both time frames? Okay, we know this is talking about the siege of Jerusalem leading up to 70 AD. Okay, we know that the gates of the city were closed during the Sabbath so nobody could leave or come in. Um, but you also have little hints and triggers that you can pick up here. Like in verse 19, Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Now how can we apply that to our day as well? I think it's quite simple. Okay, When you look at, the, when you look at a physical winter, and you look at what they had to do when they, when they fled, can you imagine how hard it would be trying to nurse a child, wandering into the wilderness, fleeing the wrath to come upon a city, and it was winter I mean just 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 understand the mindset of how how they would be how the mothers would be able to feed their young how would the young be able to survive okay now when you look at winter in a figurative sense you know I mean you think of winter as, as brutal you think of winter as uncomfortable extremely cold freezing you know, um, you know when you go outside when it's bitterly cold out, it literally just takes your breath away. Um, <clears throat> you hear phrases like "the dead of winter" and these types of things. Now, if we if 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 we apply the characteristics of winter into a figurative sense, okay, and the dangers of winter, and you apply this to the figurative sense, you look at the school systems. You look at uh, how children are being brought up today, how they are being taught, like the, from the transgender movements and these types of things, and the school systems teaching these things. You know, prayer being taken out of school, the public school just being totally corrupt, accepting other forms of religion, but saying we need to maintain a separation of church and state, but allowing other religions to be taught, but not the religion of the Bible. 
Okay. Um, you have the breaking of the commandment, honor thy father and thy mother in the form of child rights. Um, you have the teachers of these school systems taking over the rights of the parents, essentially. And so when these children grow up, because they never received proper upbringing, because either both the parents are at work all the time, they always have to find babysitters because, you know, they, they can't afford to leave their kid home alone, obviously, but they have to work, you know, because everything is getting really expensive and the jobs, the price, you know, the, the, the pay that jobs are offering these days are not that great, you know, for the middle class, middle income worker. And so now you have two parents working one, maybe two jobs each sometimes. Can you see what I'm saying when you look at the aspect of winter and apply it figuratively? And how this also can apply to our time as well with children? All you got to do is look at the public schools. So... <clears throat> but that's all I'm going to cover on Matthew 24 right now. Again, we'll be going over all three accounts in detail in a future video. So in closing, I want to take a look at uh, a memorial that was um, erected in honor of Prince Titus. And it's called the Ark of Titus, which is... Um, a 1st century A.D. honorific ark located in Via Sacra, Rome, just to the southeast of the Roman Forum. It was constructed in A.D. 82 by the Emperor Domitian shortly after the death of his older brother, Titus, to commemorate Titus's victories, including the Siege of Jerusalem. The ark was provided the general model for many triumphal arks erected since the 16th century. Okay, so there's a picture of it, and there's an inscription right up here, you can't really see it, so I try to get it up as close as possible, but here it is right here, and um, I'm not going to read what it states in Roman, but here is basically a Roman square capitals, it reads thus, and here is the... Uh, English font translation of it right here and in English it is translated as which means quote the Roman Senate and people dedicate this ark to the divine Titus so obviously pagan Rome acknowledged Prince Titus as divine the son Ves Vespasianus Augustus son of the divine Vespasian. So he was basically the son of God in a pagan form, okay? Because not only Prince Titus is divine, but also the Caesar is divine. Okay, so very, very unique how things always get twisted. But I want you to really look closely at this. The Roman Senate and people dedicate this to the divine Titus. So you have Titus, who was the prince, a.k.a. the son of Vespasian. And you have this, the Roman Senate and people. Now when we go back up, all the way back up to verse 26 in Daniel, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. He, he was cut off in the midst of the week after the 69th week. And the people of the prince, you see that? The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And this Ark of Titus, really in a sense, is confirmation of that, especially the inscription. The Roman Senate and people dedicate this to the divine, we'll just, I'll just add Prince Titus, 
son of the divine Vespasian. And it was this Prince Titus who led the armies of Rome and the 10th Legion into the city and totally leveled it to the ground. Thus physically fulfilling Jesus' words of this house is left unto you desolate, never to be returned to its former state. So you can keep your eyes fixed on Jerusalem all you want. But understand, what's going on over there now is merely a stage that is being erected to create a possible, I can't say for sure, but a possible false fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel and that false fulfillment is what many many believe that is fact is that the 70th week of Daniel is regarding Antichrist and again as I stated in our videos about futurism this doctrine started in 500 years ago so you had 500 years over 500 years of seed planting that's a long time from generation to generation lots of sons and daughters lots of mothers and fathers can you imagine how hard now it has to be for some of these people to come out of such a thing that they have been conditioned from birth to birth to birth years upon years it is only the work of God that can break that spell of conditioning of a poisonous doctrine that was erected over 500 years ago so even though I may come out harshly against dispensational futurism and stuff at, at times understand I know where you guys are. I know where you're coming from. I understand how hard it is and I understand how sincere a lot of you people are. But it's time it's time to wake up. It's time to stop relying on the trusts of men and just simply receive information sure but make sure you diligently yourself search it out a little bit here a little bit there and the more you stay grounded in God and in, in, his, in his word I can almost guarantee you if you accept this by faith that he will open your eyes to the truth and once your eyes are open to the truth oh my goodness <laughs> then you are going to see the fangs show um, and, and that's just the way it is so again don't take these things as as a harsh attack against those that believe um, futurism a future 70th week and these types of things is it error yes it's error is it deception yes it is deception but again I also understand that this has been <laughs> this has been five centuries of condi of conditioning over 500 years and you can't just ex expect people to just snap out of it via the words of Joe Smo from Kokomo okay you plant the seed others will water but it is only God that can give the increase all you can do is just share the information and plant the seed. 
And that's what this whole series is about. And that's what this section of the series is about. And that's what every video hope that I do is about. And maybe except for my readings, because I just do that as, you know, as to learn more myself and these types of things. But, and as well, so others can have something else to uh, listen to and stuff like that. But, <clears throat> but I mean, that's it. That's all I have for you in this video. So hopefully um, this has blessed you. And um, I want to thank you for listening. And um, again, don't be deceived by phony interpretations of Scripture. Don't be deceived by every wind of doctrine. Because there's a lot of it out there. So, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.